Hi, my name is Matthew Kelly, and today I'm going to go over a derivation for the equations of motion for a cart pole. A cart pole is a simple mechanical system that consists of a cart traveling along a track, and hanging from the cart is a pole, or a pendulum, and it just freely rotates about this point. Typically, you have a motor, either in the rails or in the cart, that, can, that moves the cart back and forth along the rails. This is commonly seen in controls labs to just use as a demo in teaching control theory. So what do I mean by the equations of motion? Well, it's essentially the acceleration of the system, but at a higher level, it's a mathematical description of the dynamics of the system, how the system moves. For example, if I push on the cart this way, how will the cart accelerate this way, and how will the pendulum move? So. To start that derivation, we're going to first need to assign a bunch of symbols so that we can uh, mathematically describe our system. Starting simple, we have m1, which is going to be describing the mass of the cart, and m2, which describes the mass of the pole. To keep things simple, we'll assume that all of the mass of the pole is collapsed to a point at the end of it, and this just keeps the math a little bit shorter. The pole is of length L and the motor applies some horizontal force, capital F. The cart can move horizontally, and that motion is described by the state vector, the state x and x dot, where x is the position of the cart, and x dot is the velocity of the cart, where the dot just means derivative with respect to time. And that's the first degree of freedom of the system. The second degree of freedom is the rotation of this pole, which is described by the angle theta from this negative vertical, and theta dot, which is the angular rate. When we say we want to find the equations of motion, what that means precisely here is we want an equation for x double dot and theta double dot. Using those, we can then integrate the system to find x dot and x, given some initial condition. This is how a simulation would work, for example. We'll define two position vectors. The first is from the origin to the center of mass of the cart, which happens to be where the pole is hung from. And also, uh, second, P2, which is vector from the origin to the tip of the pendulum. We have an inertial reference frame, or world reference frame, in which those vectors live with a horizontal component, i hat, and a vertical component, j hat. We also have what's called a body reference frame. So you can think of this as a unit vector that's pinned to the pendulum. So e hat is the direction from this point out along the rod towards this point. Since it's a unit vector, it has a magnitude of 1, and it really just gives a direction. Now that we have that, we can start drawing some free body diagrams. So you see, I've taken both of the rigid bodies, the cart and the pole, and separated them out, and then drawn in all of the forces that connect them to the world. If we look in closer, we see we have the normal force of the track pushing up on the cart, the horizontal force of the motor, another vertical force for its weight, and then the two components of the tension in the rod, or the constraint force or the contact force, whatever you want to call it. We see that same force applied equal and opposite, in an equal and opposite way to the pole, where it's connected at that point. And then we also have the weight of the pole. One key thing to notice here is that, if you recall up here, I said that there's two degrees of freedom, the horizontal motion of the cart and the rotation of this rod. So we're going to need two free body diagrams. And sure enough, we have one, two free body diagrams. So that's something just to pay attention to and keep track of when you're trying these techniques on another system. There are many ways to solve the dynamics. And what we're going to use here are, are the Newton-Euler equations. These are essentially a vector version of the f equals ma equation that you learned in high school. Um, there are other methods to do this. A common one being the Lagrange equations, which are typically taught in more advanced dynamics classes in college. But we'll start, we'll keep it simple and just use the uh, fancy version of F equals MA.
So this side of the equation is F, which is the sum of forces. So we have the horizontal forces. And in this picture, what we've drawn in are the scalar values. So this is just the, how much force, what's the, what's the magnitude? What's the magnitude of this? And now we're gonna assign it direction. So force magnitude multiplied by a unit vector direction. Again, we do the same thing in the vertical direction, multiply it by j hat for the vertical direction. On the left, on the right hand side, we have mass times acceleration, where acceleration is just the second derivative of the position of the center of mass. So that was that p1 vector we had up here. We take two derivatives, it now becomes an acceleration vector. And we'll cover later how we, how we write that out. We can then apply the exact same procedure to the pole. So we'll zoom out a little bit here and we get, we have three forces. We see the forces here assigned to the correct direction. And again, mass times acceleration. Now, you might think that we're done at this point, but it's always good to check and see how many unknowns you have and how many equations you have. So here, we actually have three unknown forces, the normal force and the two components of the tension force. And we also have two unknown accelerations, x double dot and theta double dot. That gives us five unknowns. And this equation is in two dimensions, and this equation is in two dimensions. So that's four equations. It turns out that forces and accelerations, at least for simple problems like this, will enter in linearly. So if we want to solve for five unknowns, we're going to need five equations. We get the fifth equation by doing um, what I would call a torque balance. Um, another word for it is angular momentum balance. And it's very similar to F equals MA, but it's just torque equals um, some, some angular acceleration times angular inertia. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of ways to write this out. And I've used the more general vector version of this, which is that the torques are going to be represented by a relative position vector crossed with a force vector. Um, so in this case, we have P2 minus P1, which is a vector pointing from here out to here. And we also have a weight vector here. The cross product is simply taking this vector and kind of projecting it perpendicular to this um, vector and then multiplying them. So it's essentially the torque that weight is producing about this point. Now I'd like to stop and just point out something that's kind of important, which is that whenever you do a torque balance, you have to pick a point to s about which your torques are being summed. And here I've picked this pivot point, and that's not an accident. It turns out to make the math a lot easier because I have these two unknown forces, but since they're both traveling through the point, when I compute the torque produced by them, it's zero because there's no moment arm. And that just makes the math a little bit easier. But you could actually do this at, at any point and it would still work. Now the right hand side of the equation is a little bit complicated. There's a bunch of ways to write it. And um, essentially you have to capture some rotational inertia times some rotational acceleration. The way that I like to do this is you have the relative position of the center of mass and then you multiply it or you cross it with the mass times the translational acceleration of that point. So here P2 is the center of mass because it's a point mass. And so we just have mass times that acceleration crossed with that vector. And that's the rate of change of angular momentum of this link. Now, another way that you might see to do this is to explicitly compute the moment of inertia of this about that point, and then multiply that by theta double dot. And it turns out that that'll give you the same answer. It's just a different way of writing it out. One thing to keep in mind when you do it this way is that if you're not working with a point mass, you have to add another term for the rotational inertia multiplied by this ex second derivative of the angle for any moment of inertia about the center of mass. Since we've chosen a point mass, that term drops out in this derivation. So that concludes the first part of this derivation, and I'll come back in a second video and cover how we do all the algebra to convert these equations into the desired accelerations that we would like.